computer is acting up a little bit, so as soon as it's ready. Did we start chapter 5? Any questions from chapter 5? Thank you. Where did we stop last time? Structure of enzyme? Active site? Right here? Oh, please don't do this. Okay. okay. Active site right here. You were using the other. Um... Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. On yeah, right. That was the last year. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> yep. We did. Yeah. Did we do this part right here? Nope. All right. Active or catalytic site? No. Okay. So let's do this. Yep. Let's start from here. Let's go back right here. Enzymes. I asked you my question. I asked what's the difference between hammer and an enzyme, right? I asked you that. Okay. So. <clears throat> enzyme. Right? Substrate. Can I put this substrate anywhere in this enzyme? No. There's a special area on every enzyme where the substrate must bind. Okay. Almost all enzymes they have another area on. Okay, which is called. Did I mention this one or no? Okay. Almost all enzymes they have another area. Right. This cap has this bulging right here. This is called. Anyone knows that? The other site, really. <laughs> Sometimes it is, called, it is. It is called the other site or the allosteric site. Allosteric. Or you can call it the other site. If I draw this enzyme like this, 
Let me get this out of the way. Like this. You have, so you, here's an enzyme, here's the active site, and this little notch that I have right here, here's the active site, active or catalytic site, and here is the other site or allosteric, allosteric site, site. We will look at the function of the allosteric <clears throat> okay, but many enzymes have that, okay? <clears throat> But this is the site right there where the enzymes, okay, where the substrate binds right there, okay. If you, if you have the book, you can go to page 116 in your book, and I'll show you this. Uh, allosteric site that I'm talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. One sixteen, one one six. See this enzyme right here? This is the active site right here. See this little notch right here? That is the allosteric site right there. Allosteric site. This is where the substrate will bind, substrate. What binds here? I, I think we will have time to go over what is the purpose of this allosteric site. Yep. Mm -hmm. Does it even label it here? Not even your book. Hmm. Oh yeah, it does label it right here. On page 118, it's labeled right there. Right here. See? L or steric side. This. Right there. Okay, one. All right. <clears throat> yep. Mm -hmm. Allosteric site. Yep. Yep. All right. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> enzyme structure. What has enzyme made up, made up of? Enzyme. All right. Protein. All enzymes are made up of 100% protein. True or false? All enzymes are made up of 100% protein. False. Yep. All enzymes are not made up of 100% protein. Okay. Some are. Some enzymes are made up of 100% protein. Not all. Okay. Enzyme structure. There are some pro enzymes that are made up of 100% protein. We call them pure, pro pure pure enzymes or simple enzymes. Okay. On the other hand, there are many enzymes that have two components, protein and non-protein. These enzymes are called holoenzymes, holoenzymes, okay? What is the non-protein part? Non-protein part could be either organic or inorganic, okay? Non-protein part could be either organic or inorganic. If it is organic, we call it coenzyme. If it is inorganic, it's called cofactor. Here's more detail right here. <clears throat> Coenzymes is an organic molecule. 
examples, vitamin K, okay, or folic acid. <coughs> Commonly used in synthesis of nucleic acids. That's why vitamins are so important. You don't take your vitamins, some of your metabolic pathways will shut down. Okay. On the other hand, if you take bottled water, bottled people who drink bottled water, that may not have minerals at all. Okay, you are depriving yourself of cofactors. Okay, no minerals, no cofactors. Some of your enzyme may not be complete, like zinc, manganese, magnesium. Okay, some of the enzyme may not be complete. That's why minerals are so important. Okay, if you have filters at home that just get filters from your tap water, that's not good. Okay, then you have to take pills of minerals. Okay, so both minerals and vitamins are important in your diet. All right? So cofactors, that's why cofactors and coenzymes are essential. These are called, um, that's why you do, your diet is, uh, in your diet there are two types of nutrients. These are, you can also call them micronutrients, micronutrients, coenzymes and cofactors. Macronutrients that you need in large quantities like amino acids and carbohydrates, right? But these are required in minute quantities, micronutrients. Okay. If I draw you diagram for these, uh, I think visual may help you remember them a little better. Okay. <clears throat> if you, if I use black color for, for protein part of the protein part, black color. So some proteins are honey. Some enzymes are 100% protein. So this is protein, simple. Protein, simple. Simple enzyme. On the other hand, holo enzymes. Holo enzyme. Two parts, protein and non-protein. So you have to use black color that will represent protein part which is called apo. A apo, okay. So apo and then non-protein part could be organic. If it is organic, okay, it is called coenzyme. So let's use green color for this. Apple, and then this is coenzymes. Coenzyme, which is organic. Organic, green color. You can use red color for cofactor. Apple plus cofactor. Which is inorganic. Inorganic. Right? So both of them, holoenzyme, they have two parts. Apple which is protein protein plus organic protein plus inorganic. Make sense? Okay. <coughs> Simple enzyme are hundred percent protein. Holo enzymes, they have two parts. Protein part and a non-protein part which could be organic or inorganic. All right. <coughs> My diagram is better. This is in your textbook on page number 116. I think 116. 116? No, sorry. No, not 116. 
114. This diagram is page 114. 114. How does the enzyme and substrate react with each other? What happens? Okay. <clears throat> this diagram is on page number 116. 116. Let's look at the diagram, then we'll come back and look at the description. Enzyme substrate interaction. Okay. First, substrate reacts with the active site of the enzyme, and you have a complex called enzyme substrate complex. Once it, do you have the enzyme substrate complex, there are three possibilities here. Three possibilities. Okay. This substrate may be broken down okay, into smaller pieces or you may start with two small molecules and it could be anabolic reaction to build them together. Okay. This reaction is catabolic we start with one large molecule and it is broken down into two small pieces. Or you may start with two small pieces and build a large molecule. What's the third possibility? Hmm? And so what will what will happen at the end? Hmm. So what is the end product at the end? Mm. Same? Rearrange. Rearrangement of the atoms. Rearrangement of the atoms meaning what? Okay, let me, I'll explain. Rearrangement of the atoms is the answer. The molecule is going to bind to the active side, but rearrangement of the atoms. What does that mean? Rearrangement of the atoms. Okay, I'll explain. Okay. Third possibility is within the molecule, atoms are rearranged. Okay, and then the product is made. All right, so that's the third possibility. Okay. Let me tell you what is rearrangement means. All right. Okay, for that I need to go back to my. Mm, this one. Let me fix it first. Just scanned it. Okay. Look at this glucose formula C6H12O6, right? Fructose C6H12O6, right? Difference. Okay. Look at right here. Carbon position number two, right here. Hydrogen and glucose has hydroxyl. When your body needs glucose immediately, but you have fructose, you don't have glucose, your body can rearrange the atoms of fructose and turn it into glucose. This is called rearrangement. Same number of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Okay, so your body can shuffle the atoms, can turn, can move, can turn hydroxyl to hydrogen to hydroxyl and turn fructose into glucose. Why does your body prefer glucose instead of fructose? Absorbs quickly, can break down glucose quickly. Why? Is the current, that's, I like that analogy, is the currency of your body, right? I like that. Why? Pardon me, simple sugar. But they both are simple sugar, monosaccharide, monosaccharide. 
Pardon me? Insulin works on glucose only. Uh, yeah. Why? I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> My daughter used to say that when she was a little. Why? Why? Quick ATPs. Very, very good, yeah. Glycolysis usually starts with, usually starts with glucose. Why? <laughs> it is simple sugar, yeah. Why? <laughs> okay, the answer is, answer is, the enzyme that breaks down glucose is always in your cells. Enzyme that breaks down fructose is not. The enzyme that breaks down galactose is not always. Enzyme that breaks down glucose is always in your cells. It is a constitutive enzyme. It is always in your cells. The cell doesn't have to make it. Other enzymes are inducible enzymes. Cells, they have to make it. They're not always there. Like, for example, jello. When you eat jello, then your cells make gelatinase. When you drink milk, your cells, they make lactase or caseinase. They are inducible enzyme. So your cells, they make energy instantly from glucose. You drink glucose, boom, you get energy because enzymes are constitutive. So your cells prefer glucose. They don't have to go an extra step to make it. That's the answer. Okay? Anyways. So the first step, like for example, this one we talked about, you see this reaction? Two enzymes, two, I'm sorry, two small molecules, they can be linked together, and a large molecules could be made. This is called anabolic reaction or synthetic reaction, right? Okay, so that's one possibility. Or it could be catabolic reaction, hydrolytic, okay? Broken down this way, the water is returned, this water that you, we took out, it is returned and it's broken down into two separate molecules. Catabolic reaction or simply rearrangement of the atoms. Okay? All right. All right. So mechanism of enzymatic action. All right. One, the substrate combines with active side of the Excuse me. Oh, thanks. Oh. Then you have a, a, a temporary compound called substrate enzyme complex. Then the substrate modified by one of the three methods. Rearrangement of the existing atoms, catabolic reaction, or anabolic reaction. Okay. Now once the change is made, the substrate is now called what? The product. The transformed substrate molecule, which is now called the product, separates from the active site. What happens to the enzyme? Remember, enzyme is never used in the reaction. It is free to react with other substrate molecule. Enzyme is unchanged, unaltered, ready to react with the other substrate molecule. All right? <clears throat> it can be used again and again and again. So that's the summary of reaction between enzyme and substrate. Any questions? Straightforward. Classification of enzyme. The old classification of enzyme, 50, 60 years ago, all enzymes that worked on lipids, we call them what? Lipases. Okay. All enzyme that worked on uh, sugars, glucases, glucases. Okay. What else? Proteases. Proteases and so on. Very crude classification. Okay. But nowadays, classification is very precise. 
enzymes are classified according to what type of reaction the enzyme uh, carries on. Okay. Six major groups of enzymes. Uh, now, the second exam asks you um, classes. Now, if you want, okay, I have the class and I have at least one example from each class. I want you to memorize the class and its example. If you want, I can what it does for your information. If you don't, I can just read them for you. For example, oxidoreductase is the first group. You can tell just from by looking what do they do? Oxidoreductases, they carry out reduction reaction. Okay? The example I have is cytochrome oxidase. Now if you want I can tell you where do you find it, what it does for your own information. But on the test I will not tell you. I mean I'm not going to ask you. But if you want I can tell you where do you find it in the bacterial cell, where do you find it in the human cell. You want to know? Okay. All right. Okay. Cytochrome. You make an educated guess. Where do you think you will find it? The highest concentration of this enzyme in human cell. First of all, what is? Okay. So, yeah, mitochondria. Okay. Because cytochrome is cytochrome chain is mitochondria. Okay. Cytochrome chain makes ATP, and cytochrome chain is a, another name for electron transport chain. And you'll find the highest concentration of this enzyme in mitochondria. But, but bacteria don't have mitochondria. What is the alternate of mitochondria in bacteria? Cell membrane. So in bacteria, you'll find the highest concentration of this enzyme in the cell membrane. Cell membrane. What does it do? What does it do? Okay. <clears throat> very quickly because we are going to talk about this. All right. Let me show you this. Aerobic respiration, everyone knows that, right? Aerobic respiration. All right. This enzyme. Do you break down into this is something that prokaryote and eukaryote? No. No. Not going to ask you that. No. This is just FYI. Okay. This is electron transport chain. Okay. No. In aerobic respiration, why do we breathe in air? Okay. Air, when you say aerobic respiration, there is oxygen involved, right? When you breathe in oxygen, what is the purpose? Of course, to keep you alive, but in aerobic respiration, okay, there are three steps aerobic respiration glycolysis, Krebs cycle. Electron transport chain. This is electron transport chain. What is the purpose of respiration? To accept electron. When you say accept electron, what electron? Okay. Electron that were released. I mean, I'm going to show you when we talk about respiration. I'll show you. I will show you where those electrons are coming from. Okay. Electron that were released in glycolysis and Krebs cycle. Okay, there are little trucks. Okay, there are little trucks okay, that pick up electrons from glycolysis and in Krebs cycle. Okay, let me show you those little trucks. Okay, if I may, just quickly. Here we go. Here is a complete summary of aerobic respiration. Right here. I call them trucks, little trucks. Okay, here's glycolysis right here. Here's a truck called NAD. NAD. When it leaves, when it enters into glycolysis, it called NAD. But when it left, it picked up what? Hydrogen. It became NADH. So, glycolysis. The purpose of glycolysis. One purpose of glycolysis is to generate energy. Right? That's the main purpose, to generate energy. The second and the most important purpose of glycolysis is to generate hydrogen. 
And you know hydrogen bomb, you have heard of hydrogen bomb, right? How much energy hydrogen bomb has? A whole lot. So the second purpose of hydrogen is to generate this hydrogen, which is picked up by this little truck called NAD. It becomes NADH. So this glycolysis, it produces two NADHs. And where do they go? To electron transport chain. Okay? Hydrogen is the fuel. Hydrogen is the fuel that runs electron transport chain. So these electrons that are released, what electrons? Hydrogen. Electrons, they are sent to electron transport chain. And where do, who do you think, who do you think accepts these electrons at the end? Oxygen. And now remember, the enzyme, I'm talking about the enzyme, cytochrome oxidase, right? This is the enzyme that links the oxygen with the hydrogen at the end. The enzyme cytochrome oxidase is the enzyme that links the hydrogen and the oxygen together right here at the end. These enzyme, this hydrogen, they bounce like a hot potato. Think of hydrogen as a hot potato. It is bouncing from top. Let me go back. Right here. Look at this right here. This is NADH. Literally unloads its hydrogen and it becomes NAD. Unloads its cargo, hydrogen, becomes empty. Where do you think it goes? Back to glycolysis to pick up more hydrogen. And so this hot potato hydrogen, uh, hydrogen atoms, this starts to move from high energy to low energy. Right here. Eventually they jump out at electron transport chain. And who's there to grab at this hot potato? Oxygen, right here. And who clinks them together? Cytochrome oxidase. OK? Yeah. Told you, if you don't want to know, <laughs> I will not explain. <laughs> it's a little, little bit complicated, but OK. But this is what this enzyme do, OK? So this enzyme, cytochrome oxidase, is involved where? In cytochrome chain. Okay. Number two, transferases. They transfer something, right? Transferases. Transfer. Transfer what? Okay. They move one of these groups, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen from one molecule to another, from one substrate to another. Example, alanine, alanine, deaminase. What is alanine? Amino acid. Amino acid. D means removal. removal. Aminase from amino group. All amino acids, they have an amino group. Amine, A-M-I-N-E, amine group. So this enzyme, it removes the amine group from alanine to another molecule. Alanine, deaminase. Okay. What happened? No, 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 no. Sorry. Okay, fine. Hydrolase. This is one of the most common enzymes involved in catabolic reaction catabolic reactions because it adds water uh, to break covalent bonds. Sucrase, maltase, gelatinase. Please underline number four highlighted. As you can see, I have put this in red letters. Lyase. This breaks covalent bond without adding water. This is exception. Whenever you break a covalent bond, you add water. But this is exception. exception. Isocitrate lyase, this is involved in Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle, which is also called citric acid cycle. This breaks covalent bond without adding water. 
Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isomerases. Iso means same. Iso. Mer from molecule. Isomerase. They are responsible for rearrangement of the atoms within the same molecule. Iso, same, mer, molecule. Arrangement, rearrangement of the atoms within the same molecule. This is involved in glycolysis. Glucose, phosphate, isomerase. The very first step of glycolysis actually. Very first step of glycolysis. Last enzyme, ligases. <clears throat> this is involved in DNA replication. DNA ligase. Links the small molecules of DNA together. DNA ligase. So those are the six classes of Enzymes. Alrighty. Location of enzymes. Question. All enzymes are made inside the cell. True or false? Okay. All enzymes are made inside the cell. Okay. One more time. Okay. Maybe if I draw the diagram, that will help. All enzymes are made inside the cell. They are synthesized inside a cell. Okay. Again. All proteins are made inside the cell. True. True. Where is the factory that makes protein? So ribosomes are inside the cell, outside the cell? Okay. So if the factory is inside, <laughs> then they are made inside the cell. So let me ask you again. All enzymes are made inside the cell? True. True. All enzymes are used inside the cell. False. Okay. So all enzymes are made because the factory that makes it inside the cell. But now all, en all enzymes are used inside the cell. Okay. So location of enzyme. Okay. Two types of enzyme. All enzymes are made, but they are enzymes that are made inside, but they are used outside. They are called exoenzyme. Or this is how bacteria eat. If they don't put the enzymes outside, how are they going to eat? They cannot eat without these enzymes, right? Name one extracellular enzyme. Hmm? Bacon. That's amylase. Amylase, yeah, very good. Yeah, amylase. Yeah. Bacteria, many bacteria that can eat starch, can they make amylase? Sure, gelatinase, okay. lipase. Those are all extracellular enzymes. Actually, they cannot live without extracellular enzymes because they need to eat. Okay. Can you live without extracellular enzymes? No. If we do not, do not make extracellular enzymes, how are you going to eat food? You make extracellular enzymes <coughs> track so you can. Yeah. 
How about intracellular enzyme? Do we make intracellular enzyme? Do we make intracellular enzyme? Yeah. Of course. I mean, how can you make ATP without intracellular enzyme? So all living cells make intracellular enzyme. Intracellular enzymes are those enzymes that are made inside and they are used inside. <clears throat> okay. So intracellular or endoenzymes. Enzymes that are inside and used inside. Okay. <clears throat> How about if, an, if a bacterium like E. coli, it has 1,000 genes. Okay, a typical bacterium like E. coli, it has 1,000 genes. Do you think those 1,000 genes will be active all the time? Okay. Do you think some genes will be active all the time? Hmm? What kind of genes will be active all the time? Okay. So a bacterium like E. coli, it has 1,000 genes. <clears throat> what type of genes or what type of enzyme do you think it will make all the time? Even when the E. coli is sleeping. They don't sleep, but okay. How about the genes that are involved in making ATPs? Right? When you're sleeping, your heart is beating, right? You're breathing. So those genes that are involved in cellular respiration, they're always active. How about if the bacteria, OK, it has a gene to make the enzyme gelatinase, but the medium has no gelatin. Would that gene be active? No. no. OK. So two types of genes, or two types of proteins, or two types of enzymes. Those genes that are active all the time, or those enzymes that are made all the time, they are called constitutive enzymes. They are always present in a cell. Constitutive. Always. <clears throat> OK. Are those enzymes that are involved in cellular respiration, constitutive. But on the other hand, those enzymes that are made when their substrate is present, they are called inducible or adaptive enzymes. Proteins or enzymes that are made only when they are needed, when they are inducer or their substrate is present. They are called inducible or adaptive enzymes. Gelatinase, lipase, okay, lactase, okay, so on. What are some of the major factors that can influence the activity of enzymes? First one, temperature. What's the effect of high? increases the activity, okay? So if you boil an enzyme, it's going to speed up? No. no. Okay, all right. All right. So high temperature, like boiling, denature. It will. What does that mean, denature? Break it. Break it. Lose some of the value, Lisa says. sides. Break the bond? Peptide bond. Peptide bond. All right. Oh, here it is. This is the, temp this is the effect of high temperature. Here's protein. Let's suppose this is the active site right here. OK. This is the high temperature. All the peptide bonds are gone, no active site. So this is what denature means. It loses its active site. No active site. OK. Uh, normal, pro most, most, not all, most enzyme, they have what structure? Is this primary structure, secondary, or tertiary, or quaternary? Tertiary. Tertiary. 
most proteins or most enzymes, they have tertiary structure. This is from, so when you, uh, when you expose it to high temperature, it turns into primary structure, primary protein. That's what denature means. The most complex protein is what? Hemoglobin, quaternary structure, quaternary, okay? So this is what denature means. How about cold temperature? What is their effect on, on enzymes? They slow down, the, they, don't, they do not denature, they slow down the energy of the enzyme and substrate. So in your refrigerator, your food goes bad or not? You must have special refrigerator. Okay. <laughs> so, at in the refrigerator, the and the energy <laughs> at which the enzyme and substrate they come in contact, oh, they come in contact with each other once in a while. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, the energy is not there. Okay. So your food does go bad. So the energy is very little, very low. Okay. That's what the, the low temperature will do. Even in the freezer, the reaction will go on, but very little. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But most of the damage in the freezer is not because of the enzyme substrate; it's because of the physical damage caused by the crystallization. Yeah. Crystallization. pH. pH. What does pH do? Okay. Most, okay, every enzyme has its own um, optimum pH. Not all enzymes are, are functioning, uh, function best at normal pH, neutral pH. For example, there are bacteria that function best in pH 1, sulfuric acid. You put your finger in concentrated sulfuric acid, what do you have? Bony finger. Okay. <laughs> but there are some bacteria that function best in that sulfuric acid, like H. pylori, that causes peptic ulcer. It's very happy. Okay. So not all microorganisms, not all bacteria function best at neutral pH. There are bacteria that can grow in bleach. Okay. So not all microorganisms function best at neutral pH. All right. Every enzyme has its own neutral pH, I mean, it has its own optimum pH. Substrate concentration. So if you take three tubes and give them different substrate concentrations, low substrate concentration, equal substrate concentration, and higher substrate concentration, in which environment do you think the enzyme will function the best? Okay, remember, enzymes are not used by the reaction. They are free to react with more substrate once the end product is made. So in tube one and tube A, let's put less substrate. Let's put 50 substrate and 100 enzymes. Let's, in the middle tube, B, let's put equal number of enzyme and substrate, 100 and 100. 100 substrate, 100 enzyme. And in the last tube, let's put 200 substrates and 100 enzyme. In which test tube do you think the enzyme will function the best? C. Okay. The correct answer is? Because once the end product is made, there's more substrate for it to react with. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So they function best when there's extra substrate. Okay. Yeah. All right.
enzymes, they function optimally when there is extra substrate in the environment. This diagram of you will find in your book on page number 117. Yeah. This just shows you this is not an ideal really for all the enzyme. This just shows this, this enzyme. What is the optimum temperature for this enzyme? It's about 35. But not all enzymes function optimally at 35. Okay. This is about 35. What is the optimal pH for this enzyme? About about five, about five, yeah, about five, five point five, right there. Okay, and this one does show that the higher substrate concentration is ideal for enzyme activity. Okay. Oh, one more question here. Is Optimum growth temperature is optimum growth temperature suitable for all enzyme activity. Is optimum growth temperature is best for all cellular activity? Davis is saying no. Okay, let me repeat the question. Is optimum growth temperature also best for all cellular activity? No? Okay. Give me one example that illustrates that optimum growth temperature is not best for all cellular activities. You can use example, human example or bacterial example. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Is, okay, the question is, is optimum growth temperature is also best for all cellular activities? Same, same microorganism, yeah, it should be. What do you think? Okay, okay answer is no. Example, when the big boss was creating human beings, okay, he did not leave the male gonads outside for a reason. He said, eh, just leave them outside. They look good there. No. Okay. <laughs> no. Spermatogenesis takes place best at 35 degrees. Right? So, and growth takes place. Somatic cells grow best at what temperature? 37 degrees. Okay. So growth temperature is not suitable for all cellular activities. Another example, in lab, the very first bacterium that we use, Serratia marcescens, the best temperature for growth is 37 degrees. But if you grow it at 37 degrees, it is white. So what we did, we turned the uh, incubator off. The reason? At room temperature, it produces beautiful red pigment. If you turn the mic incubator on, the red pigment disappears. So the growth temperature is not suitable for all activities. It will not make red pigment at 37 degrees. Okay? Serratia marcescens. Serratia marcescens is white at 37 degrees. It only makes red pigment at room temperature. So in old days, centuries ago, people saw statues, they're crying blood. Guess what? Serratia marcescens was growing. Okay. <laughs> and when the temperature increased, the blood disappeared. Okay. <laughs> so that's what was, what was going on. All right. So ideal growth temperature is not good for all cellular activity. All right. Okay. 
inhibitors of enzymatic activity. What does that mean? Okay. <clears throat> enzymatic activities can be used to control the growth of microorganisms. Sometimes intentional, sometimes it is unintentional. That mean? All right. You go to for some time, and the doctor can give you a medication that look like the normal substrate of the bacteria, that you can take the pill and stop the growth of microorganism. Okay, there are five different types of uh, inhibitors that we are going to talk about, but in this chapter only three types. The other two types I'm going to talk about in chapter eight because that involves genetics. Okay. One is called comparative inhibition. Second is non-comparative inhibition. Third is feedback. So three types here. The other one is um, I think it's called enzyme induction, enzyme repression. Those two in chapter. Uh, eight. What is comparative inhibition and what is non-comparative inhibition? What she said. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's talk about it. Diagram on page number 118. Let's look at the diagram first, then I'll draw my own simplified version, and then I'll. Comparative inhibition. In comparative inhibition, okay, here's the enzyme right here, here's the substrate. This bacterium right here is causing some disease in, in a person, individual. The person goes to the doctor and the doctor gives this person this pill. Take this pill please. And the person takes the pill and the bacteria is now confused. The pill resembles, look at this part of the the bacterial normal substrate right here. Doctor tells you, please do not skip the, the dose. If you skip the dose, what's going to happen? The concentration of this chemical is going to reduce. The bacteria is going to pick up the normal substrate and the bacteria will keep on growing. So you have to keep taking the medication to keep the concentration of the medication in the blood. So bacteria will pick up the wrong, um, the wrong chemical. This is called molecular mimicry. You're trying to trick the bacteria to pick up the wrong medication, right? wrong substance, wrong substance right here. If the wrong chemical fits into the active site, what will happen? Whatever the end product bacteria is trying to make will not be made. Okay? In this case, the example that I have mentioned in my notes, all bacteria, all bacteria, they use a chemical substance called PABA, para-aminobenzoic acid, to make folic acid. Folic acid is used to make nucleic acids, DNA. DNA is used for cell replication. So if the normal PABA goes in, bacteria will be able to make DNA and it will grow. <coughs> Excuse me. But if the, if the if uh, the doctor gives the, the medication, uh, uh, f f sulfur drug, sulfur drug goes in, no folic acid, no DNA, bacteria will die. Okay? But here's a good thing. We do not, humans do not have this metabolic pathway. So we are not harmed at all. Okay? Like there are other medications that can cause side effect. There are no side effects because we don't make this folic acid. We take our folic acid from food or in the pill form. So this selectively kills bacteria. Okay? Uh, so this is called comparative inhibition. 
two molecule that have the same structure are competing for the same active site. Okay. If I draw my own diagram, well, I think that's going to be a little easier, easier than that. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> here is Pava. Here is sulfur drug. Sulfur. They both compete for this active site. Okay. If this goes in, what is bacteria going to make? Folic acid. Folic acid, which is going to be used to make what? Nucleic acid. Nucleic acid, which is used for cell growth. This is normal, right? That's normal. But if Sulfur goes in, this goes in. What happens? No folic acid, no nucleic acid, no cell growth. And that is comparative inhibition. Make sense? Now, before I put this away, okay, while we have this diagram, no, let's just do the. So that is comparative inhibition. Nope. Molecules similar to a substrate can bind to enzymes active side and prevent the formation of end product. Replacement of PABA with sulfur drugs. Human cells do not make folic acid, therefore sulfur drugs selectively kill bacteria. Sulfonylamides. Sulfonylamides, there are other sulfur drugs too. Yeah. Uh, I think if there is one called uh, trimethoprim. Trimethoprim, there is another one. Yeah. Non-comparative inhibition. Now this is where the allosteric site or the other site comes in picture. Non-competitive inhibition because there is no competition between, between the substrate and the active site. Substances such as lead and other heavy metals, not guns and roses, okay? <laughs> They attach to the allosteric site. There should be a space with. And what do they do? When they bind to the allosteric site, they change the shape of the active site. All right. So the end result is the same. All right. So let's say. This example let's let's take from the same example here let's suppose papa is there okay you are you're not taking sulfur okay but this time you have Heavy metal, you're living in an old house, 
and this house has lead in, in the paint, okay? That lead is going to bind to the allosteric site right here. When this lead is going to bind right here, it is going to change the shape of the active site. It's like when someone is punched in the stomach, not on the face, what happens to the facial expressions? Okay, <laughs> that's exactly right. So the facial expressions change right there. No folic acid. No nucleic acid. No growth. No competition between the substrate and the metal. and the metal, heavy metal. That's why it's called non-competitive inhibition. Okay. And the third one, this is competitive inhibition. This is on comparative innovation and the third one is feed innovation FBI FBI okay FBI is actually a regulatory mechanism okay when the cell has plenty of protein or enzyme, it shuts off its synthesis. It's a, the purpose of this is not to kill the cell, but to regulate or control the synthesis of a specific protein or enzyme. Okay? This is a regulatory or regulation mechanism. For example, <clears throat> there's a nice diagram in your book. I'll let me show you that, then I'll come back and draw my own simple diagram. On page number 119, 119, Okay. Let's suppose that the cell bacteria needs 1,000 molecules of protein X to make its capsule. 1,000 protein X to make its capsule. Okay. And this is a pathway right here. This is pathway that makes this protein X right here. End product protein X to mix make capsule. And this is 1001. This is extra. Okay, this is 1001. Does it need it? No. This is extra molecule. Capsule is being made. This is extra. So this extra protein X is going to go up and bind to right here, allosteric site of this enzyme right here and shut off its own synthesis. You see, this is a metabolic pathway that is making protein X that is used to make capsule, right? We have already made 1,000. This is extra. So when the end product is plentiful, okay, the end product is plentiful, the end product shuts off its own synthesis by binding to the allosteric site of one of the enzymes. Most commonly, it is one of the first or second one, not the last one because it's going to be wasting all these resources. Okay? So end product binds to the allosteric side of one of the enzymes, first or second one, and shut off its own synthesis. That's why it's called feedback inhibition or end product inhibition. Make sense? Okay. End product or feedback inhibition, when it is plentiful, it shuts off its own synthesis. How? By binding to the allosteric side of one of the enzymes. And we just learned what happens to the active site when something binds to the allosteric site? It changes. It changes. Okay?
we just draw a simple diagram, then we will finish. So here is the I'm just going to use ABC, XYZ, extra. X-ray and product. X-ray and product goes up. Binds to the allosteric site. That's it. Done. Before we conclude, what's the difference What's the difference between non-competitive innovation and feedback innovation? Difference. And the, uh, and the feedback is the product itself, the inhibiting the enzyme. But then non-competitive is, is the other product. Outside. Very good. It is the foreign substance that inhibits inhibits the, the end product. I mean, and the um, it is the foreign substance that binds to the allosteric site. Here, it is the end product that binds to the allosteric site. What is the similarity between the two? Very good. They both involve allosteric site and they both change the active site. Very good. Good day. Good day.